He came to me in dreams. He kept appearing every night. I was not sure why, until I heard his voice saying, my eight manifestations represent eight quantum energy fields. Now, go tell the world. I awoke with a start, determined to find out what these eight quantum energy fields are and how they relate to the eight manifestations of the Lotus Born Master. From 2002 to 2015, I led a series of expeditions across the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau, searching for the mythical, legendary realm of Shangri-La. Now in 2018, we reassembled the Searching for Shangri-La expedition team and began the search for the Lotus-born master. The Lotus-born master was the father of Vajrayana or Tibetan Buddhism. In different languages, he is known by different names. In Sanskrit, Guru Padmasambhava. In Tibetan, Guru Rinpoche. In Chinese, Lianghua Sheng Da Shi. He lived in the 8th century and traveled across many regions of the Himalayas, where he appeared as different manifestations, leaving a legacy of legends and magic. Images of his eight manifestations are often depicted in murals, tankas, statues, and dances across the Himalayas. Each manifestation represents a different stage in his journey toward enlightenment and spreading Tibetan Buddhism across the Himalayas. Is it possible that behind each manifestation there may be a coded language revealing the laws of quantum physics? The Ngurumbuchi's teaching is uh, science of the the mind. Padmasambhava was in touch with the quantum reality. He lived the quantum reality. He manifested the quantum reality. You could call him the father of quantum physics for sure. Following his handprints, footprints left across the Himalayas. We launched expeditions in five countries, crossing extreme climates, covering over 20,000 kilometers within six months. We sought the wisdom of great lamas, the research of dedicated scholars, and the science of technology innovators. Our expedition teams proved the legend to be true. In order to retrace the footsteps of the Lotus-born master, we began our expedition in Bodhanarth, Kathmandu, where we sought out the expertise of the 11th Chose Kuchin Rinpoche, a specialist on the life and times of the Lotus-born master. I think it is very auspicious that uh, today uh, our journey starts on the very, very auspicious day, which is the Guru Rinpoche's uh, birth day. Before entering into Guru Rinpoche's world, first we must know where to start, like a door. So the Bodha Stupa is like the door to enter into Guru Rinpoche's world. We 
we have to understand the cosmic power of Guru Muche, the cosmic principle of Guru Muche. Through knowing the principle of Guru Muche's cosmic power, cosmic energy. Now we can understand the laws of quantum physics. Padmasambhava means lotus born. According to legend, he was born on a lotus on Lake Danashka in what is today the Swat Valley of Pakistan. Swat Valley has long been the place already described by Xuanzang in the Tang Dynasty. Uh, it's the sacred place of Buddhism. It is a paradise. Udiana is Shambhara. Everybody is practicing Vajrayana. Manifesting is Bema Gyalpo, the Lotus King, the King of Odiana or Shambhala. Tang Dynasty records tell how people in Odiana recited magic charms or spells. Holding the drum for calling Dakini or feminine energy and the mirror to divine the future, the Lotus King's magnetizing energy is expressed in chanting of mantra. Mantras are the biggest part of our culture because for a common man to utter mantra, to say and focus on that mantra, so the thought rate will go down, plus the vibrational level effect also he gets. In ancient uh, India, people believe that um, the frequency contains very specific energy. When you say the mantra, part of your body or part of your mind is resonating with the, the, the frequency. So they create a, 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 an even bigger energy. One of the fundamental ideas in quantum physics which is this dual nature of things. The things are waves, some kind of wave field, and particles. If we're talking about a mantra with sound that's generated by the human voice, there are different frequencies in that sound. For example, like the sound om. Om. Which is widely experienced and understood as a universal sound. It's first and foremost an energy. Everything in this world is energy. So sound also is an energy. Even as you hear the sound as I was chanting it, you could possibly feel that the sound began from a lower part of the body and then moved up and then became narrower and then ended kind of a hum which was not really here but in the head. In the case of home, it gets enforced in your head, in your brain and and all your uh, nerve endings become silent. Your whole nervous system becomes still. The energy goes up and it concentrates in the Agnya Chakra and in the Sahasrara Chakra, which is on top of the head. The working of endocrine glands, the enzyme, the secretion of the hormones depend on this. And then when in a negative person, these uh, mantra sound waves affect the brain. It secretes serotonin, which makes him peaceful, which secretes adrenaline, which makes him happy. So automatically, emotion create secret hormones and hormones create emotions. It is a cycle and sound and mantra 
exactly enter at a proper time, at a proper this thing and change a negative person to a positive or a bad in a good way or a demon in a godly person. Mantra with the strong intention moves faster because intention means against your emotions and you know how emotions travel through this electromagnetic field faster than the sound waves. As an energy field, mantra contains vibrational frequency. Moreover, within the sound of each mantra is an encrypted code that represents a knowledge repository. The seat uh, syllable means a encrypted or coded message, the shortened, the simplest form of a huge paragraph of a huge sutra. So frequency analysis was developed and perfected around, oh, around 1200 years ago by Al-Hidi, a famous Arabic uh, mathematician, where he would apply the analysis of the letters and the substitutions to, to find weaknesses in the ciphers. So what's encrypted in it is basically that intention that comes from your saying that mantra. If you think about encryption, it's, it's uh, basically when you think about uh, text messages, for example. I'm sending you a message from my phone, and you could be anywhere else in the world. And that information is sent from my mobile device, and it's encrypted, and it's encrypted and sent out via radio waves. Encryption is contained within this vibration. Your phone has to have the key to unlock that encryption. Even to receive frequency, you need some sort of like connection. Then, you know, the frequency is able to travel uh, efficiently and able to pass all the blessing uh, without any hindrances. The energy, you call the energy, we call that blessing, I think is, uh, is uh, something similar. Gaya, uh, this is the most uh, center place for the, all the Buddhism, uh, Buddha's followers. For Buddhists all over the world, uh, Bodh Gaya is the most sacred spot uh, because uh, that's where you find uh, the sacred Bodhi tree under which uh, Lord Buddha uh, received his enlightenment. So Bodh Gaya has special significance uh, for the um, religion of Buddhism and uh, it is much venerated in India and across the world. So it, it's a magnet that draws uh, uh, pilgrims from all over uh, Buddhist Asia as it were uh, to uh, Bihar, that is where Bodh Gaya is located, Bihar in India. Right next to the Bodh Gaya Stupa is a cremation ground and it's amazing because you have this very spiritual, beautiful stupa and right there there is a cremation ground where it, one of the crucial moments happened for Padma Sambhava. Like the Buddha before him, he decided to leave the palace and become a wandering yogi, traveling to the eight carnal grounds of India. In the cremation grounds, yogis meditated on the question of impermanence. They were communicating with spiritual energies in various stages of transition. Practicing in the place of the Kanon ground is that 
to communicate with the demonic spirit, subdue the negative energy. So when we talk about Nima Vaser, Nima Vaser is something that uh, the manifestation of uh, a very wild yogi. The Nima Vaser is like a fearless one. So he lived with all these corpses, we live with all these zombies, skeletons, ghosts, hungry animals. There are many different kinds of meaning and the purpose of coming to Hanon ground. When you see the dead body, you are supposed to understand the impermanence of this life. In Buddhism, um, the cremation ground is often a reminder of one's, of the impermanence of life. It was not uncommon to go to the cremation ground. It's a place where you're reminded of death, um, the death of material um, goods and material things as well. Some energy field there, and there must be a transformation which is happening there, and there may be channels where the spirits or the spirit energy is then dissolved in uh, what we could call just Gaia. Part of the world is, is like, we call it intermediate, intermediate world, you know? It's like um, between this life and next life. This is a, uh, like a corridor before you enter the house. Manifesting as Nima Ozar, legend says the lotus-born master stopped the sun, which means concepts of time and space as we understand them do not exist. He holds the trident, a symbol of yogis meditating in the carnal ground. Added are three heads representing past, present, and future. Where Einstein believed that time might be curved rather than straight, the yogis of the past understood that time enfolds upon itself. It is multidimensional and entangled, allowing for the existence of parallel universes and quantum communication between them. That's where practitioners would go to connect to a different universe, a parallel universe. Well, there's a lot of theory about um, parallel universes. It might have been considered frivolous decades ago that the idea of multiple instances of what we would deem reality is becoming uh, more and more credible, um, especially amongst metaphysicists and uh, theoretical physicists. Parallel universes, yes. Uh, so Stephen Hawking, right before he died, just released a paper that is, of course, being debated now. His current theory um, is one that can be tested and used to test the possibility of the multiverse, possible universes all existing, coexisting at the same time as you and I are sitting here today, um, just next to us on, on another level. So there could be that we have different instances of what we deem as reality. Uh, that are coexisting. And whether there can be, this again gets in the realm of theoretical physics, ways of channeling between the one or the other uh, is also a matter of considerable uh, discussion. Um, the concept is basically we're living in one dimension. There are many of us living in different dimensions. And therefore, if we emanate the right frequency to cross dimension, we could communicate with different astral bodies or communicate with other people through time and space. It's just entering, okay, from 4D to 5D. Then our world is just a movie. Time is just a frame that we conceptualize. In deeper terms, there's no, there's no time frame. In these other universes, it's possible that time, gravity, and, and the way which we observe everything in our universe doesn't act the same way. Now, when we talk about time, the past encompasses the present, it encompasses the future. So we don't have this linear division of time where time, actual real time, is only the present. Act, uh, time is encompassing. All time coexists. All those differences coexist in that field. So time and space is our only physical constraint in this dimension. There are no time and space constraints in other dimensions.
Urgin be my junior last one. Manifesting as Loden Chokse, the wisdom holder, the lotus born master learned from the Dakini the power of non attachment in converting negative energy to positive. In one hand, he holds the drum for summoning Dakini or feminine energy. In the other, he holds the skull cap symbolizing on attachment, the emptiness factor, allowing the mind to manage energy. So if we talk about uh, Lodin Chose, I think first we have to understand about the principle of Nima Waser. Because Nima Waser is the one who are fearless. He don't care about much about the, all the humans. You know, because he was dealing with the zombies and ghosts. After the subdued, the, the demonic spirit, then he knew that he need to also interact with the human beings. Then the Loden Choksi came. Loden is his emanation of Manjushri, very sharp mind. And he can learn Tantric, Sutra, Tantric, everything. And then Loden Choksi came and he learned in different arts. Uh, then what he learned, the most interesting uh, education uh, while he was as Loden Choksi is the communication or the code word of Dakini language. Dakinis in Tibetan, Khandro, in Chinese, Kongshimo, means Skywalker. These are feminine Shakti energy forces that can move seamlessly through time and space. In astrophysics, they may be equated with dark matter. They are energy forces that can be called upon for good and to change circumstances from negative to positive. Dakini there was Leki Wangwang, and she was the key, really. She's the one who taught Padmasambhava. When you go to a cremation ground, you can overcome negative energy with positive energy. <laughs> So Dagini, in uh, Tibetan Buddhism particularly, representing the emptiness uh, wisdom. It means when you're concentrating with your consciousness towards something, you're not changing the world, you're selecting the reality in which you want to get in. It's a way how you think, you know, in mind training, jealousy or anger, anger that arises in you, it is just a poison and it has all the negative consequences. But when this moment, if you can uh, apply the technique from Santrayana teaching, so now you have totally transformed your negative uh, energy into positive energy. <laughs> Intention is really our language to talk to energy. When we have a certain intention, basically it's a really focused energy creating coherent resonance with the object that we send the intention to. It's actually pushing the energy towards it and making the whole um, environment coherent and therefore changing it. It, as, as like you how you change um, a tuning fork. So one tuning fork resonating at the same frequency with the second tuning fork with the third tuning fork basically makes all the tuning fork uh, vibrate at the same speed. Now we'll become friends. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bless you. The greed is very powerful. 
air is fluted, water is fluted, earth is fluted. And we are talking a lot about science and quantums and physics and this and that and going to moon and maybe going to another planet, making so many, so many different type of powerful emissions. And, and on one hand, we can say we are very civilized, 21st century civilized. On the other hand, if we are not really aware about value of inner uh, goodness, like kindness, and the inner develop of wisdom and kindness, I think the world will face terrible problems. When you talk about Tatma Sambhava, then it really is connected in Tibetan Buddhism. How Tatma Sambhava deal it in Tibet, those local deity or Maras, and if we have full of anger and hate it, it we are Mara. And in you know, us, if we have full of kind, helping others, serving others, you are, you are Bodhisattva, living Bodhisattva. Upon becoming the wisdom holder, he decided to complete the matrix of Buddhism studies. Entering Nalanda University, he became a monk, a scholar, and a pandita manifesting as Padma Sambhava. However, not for long. Soon he had a vision of Princess Mandawara in the kingdom of Zahor, meditating in the mountains beside a sacred lake. He went to find the princess. This is in Guru Rinpoche's body print, backside especially. Mandara cave is inside. This is inside entrance to the main cave. Yeah, Anila, she's the caretaker of the Mandarawa cave. This is the first cave of Mandarawa. This is the main cave here. I meditated and achieved the rainbow body. Mandawara was the princess of the kingdom of Zahor. The king had no son and no heir. So all the other kingdoms around wanted to marry her to take over Zahor. In order to avoid conquest, the princess decided to become a nun. So right now we are at uh, one of the highest place uh, in the Himachal Pradesh. In Tibetan we call it Sopema. This is a place where Mandarawa realized uh, the everything. She was very beautiful. She was a princess. This Zahor kingdom to be a very beautiful kingdom. So everybody really liked to take that kingdom. The king has only a princess, only a daughter. So that's the one reason uh, she also chose to become a nun. Many princes came to Asar to marry, but she refused. And then, of course, king was must be very sad also. Then she said, okay, then if you want to do Dharma practice, then you have to go uh, up to the cave. This is the place where actually the Zaho king uh, built the nunnery for the uh, Mandarawa and 500 other nuns. When Guru Rinpoche appeared here, and then like, uh, what you call shepherds, they heard that man's voice. You can see the hole above the cave, 
where the cow heard it, the Guru Muji giving teaching to Mandarava. So this is the hole. So then the rumor started from there. And then slowly the news spread to the ministers and then they told to the king, you know. And then king was very, very angry. He sent the ministers and then told them, you go and check. And then they found, of course, Guru Muji there. And then they took Mandarawa to Mandi, where you went, and she put in the, that prison. After Zahur King found that uh, Padma Sambhava was giving teaching to uh, Princess Mandarawa and 500 nuns in the Riversal Mountain. So then that was against the kingdom's uh, kind of law. So then the punishment has to be there for the princess and Pama Sambhava. They put here as a jail. All the ministers, they brought him, Guru Muche, here and they burnt him alive. King went and see and then he found that Pama Sambhava was sitting on the lotus and all the fire, all the smoke actually turned into water as a lake. Quantum physicists believe he was able to survive the fire by altering material particles through his mind control over a light frequency. In creating mantras, you're basically creating a laser beam. We talked about mantras being sound energy and basically the sound energy coming together in a very coherent form of frequency. So laser beams are the same thing. You have light energy basically bouncing off each other, creating a giant um, coherent light beam and shooting out and becoming a laser beam. Heat or the, the energy of that intensity that is created by mantra can, can separate that cluster and make it non-visible. So that is the science of it and uh, all our rishis knew how to do it. King of Sahor came, he saw, and then he was really astonished. He suddenly had a great, of course, uh, devotion. And then he went to Guru Rinpoche, and then he said, oh, what I did, I'm very, very sorry. And then he wanted to become, of course, his uh, disciple, and also the subjects, all the people became Buddhist, and then uh, he, of course, uh, he invited Guru Rinpoche to, the, to his kingdom. And then from Bellis, he took out all this, now what Guru Rinpoche is wearing, like his hair, clothes, he offered to him, you know. The king of Sahor offered her to Guru Rinpoche. This is the cave where Mandarawa continued her practice. And also it says that this is where Mandarawa was enlightened. Together with Princess Mandawara and through the practice of consort yoga, they achieved what is called rainbow body enlightenment. The rainbow body means like, uh, you know, our body is made of five uh, skantas or uh, five aggregates, you know. And um, when our body is, because this is made of, of uh, all the poisons, and then uh, through the practice, when these five aggregates are uh, gradually purified, and then all this will transform into the body of uh, wisdoms. Rainbow light is basically the full imagination of the light frequency that we could see. Within that rainbow light, we could feel basically our whole body because it addresses every single frequency um, in the spectrum. Light carries information as well. Right, and that's if you look at about 99% of the data that's being uh, transferred around the world today is via cables underwater, right? And those cables are sending light beams with encoded information in the light beams. Part of the meditational practice is that you have to envision that light fills you up and that you have this, this light coming from inside and surrounding you. You take the plant, you take any animal, you take any 
person, like human being, all of these creatures, like all these living beings are emitting visible spectrum light. If we look at quantum physics, the reason why light is so commonly used in, in say, the double slit experiment and, and such things is that light is relatively easy to demonstrate that it has this dual nature. Like our mind is not really, uh, it doesn't have a physical form. Like uh, we say that all the body of deities is called manifold luminosity. Luminosity, actually it's the light, as, as uh, you rightly said, yeah, it's the light. At that moment, he heard the seven-line prayer, first uttered by monks in Bodhgaya, calling him back to save them from black magic. Even in Padmasambhava's time, there was this constant questioning of what was going on. And obviously, Hinduism was very prevalent then too. So there were a lot of people who would question what Padmasambhava was teaching. There was a lot of uh, uh, debate between uh, non-Buddhist and Buddhist scholars. The most serious debate happens in Bodhgaya. 500 non-Buddhist scholars came to debate with the Buddhist scholars. These non-Buddhist scholars, they have uh, not just the knowledge, but they also have some kind of psychic powers, uh, black magic and supernatural power to destroy the uh, Buddhist monks and Buddhist community in this very place. Those Buddhist scholars was almost uh, losing their debate. At that moment, all the Buddhist monks, they have prayed to the Padmasambhava to come and save them. This is actually, it is believed that uh, right now the most famous uh, Guru Padmasambhava's prayer, which we call the seven line prayer. And Guru Padmasambhava heard that, and then he came here. Padmasambhava did the debate. He was the ultimate debater in some ways because he was able to defeat everyone just with his arguments. Um, he had an answer. But there are some non-believers. They are uh, like very powerful. They try to use some kind of psychic power. If you are God Buddha, you are Shakyamuni, you have to today demonstrate that you have the highest power. So then that is where Guru Pema Sambhava manifest himself as the Guru Singer Dado, which in English we say uh, the lion's roar. And sometimes he, in the, he need to uh, purified or defeat some uh, the evil things. That's why he showed the, the wrathful forms. If your intent is driven by negative motivations, you will cause a lot of trouble because you have as much black magical power, if you want to call it that, as you do white magical power. But if you know, if you really want to deal with something tough, you read a, a strong, powerful face, or called wrathful face. Green Butcher meditate himself, that's lion head, Dagini. There is the advantage of these um, gurus or master gurus, as Padmasambhava was, that he had this ultimate cities where he could actually demonstrate there are hidden powers in us and we can convert these powers into a positive aura around us. Lion face Dakini is one of the very powerful among the deities. Many gurus have practiced, even myself, I practice lion face Dakini. It has a, such a, a positive and a strong energy. It's like uh, whatever that, uh, uh, you know, you face all this uh, bad energy, you know, if somebody sends you bad energy, you are able to reflect all the bad energy. It's a kind of reflection. According to the second law of thermodynamics, 
everything, all the information, all the difference in the universe must cancel out. There is a gradual disappearance. It's, it's one of these fundamental laws of nature that we have discovered. The, the, the way I interpret this function of Buddhist Aikido. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aikido, okay, okay, now I got it. Yeah, yeah. It's without actually, um, not necessarily uh, intentionally to harm others, but actually you, you are just protecting yourself uh, or protecting others to send back unwanted gift. And therefore he could uh, bring the power of the universal energy into his body and be able to counter it and convert it into universal energy. That materialism is not everything. See, that human mind is meant for something greater, something greater. And Padmasambhava was a manifestation of that. When we're talking about Guru Padmasambhava, eight manifestations, there is one manifestation called uh, Shakya Singhe. Shakya Singhe, they are called Shakya is a Buddha Shakya Muni, and same like he has peerless, because Singhe is a, we call lion, lion is the peerless of the, all the animals, he's a king. The lion of the Shakya lineage. The most important, the, like the second Buddha. As Shakya Senge, he manifested as the Buddha himself. His hand holds the Dorje, or Vajra, the symbol of Vajrayana Buddhism. It is not just about becoming enlightened for oneself, but using that enlightenment for action to help others and transform negative situations into positive. It is said that the place where he achieved enlightenment is the Yangle Sho Cave in Farping, Nepal. Following the footsteps of the Lotus-born master, we went to Patan, an ancient kingdom in the Kathmandu Valley, which was the center of Buddhist tantric practice at the time. It still is today. Even today, Patan, where we are right now, to the west, you've got the Persian Empire back then. North, you've got China. South, you've got India. This was the center uh, for the Silk Road in many ways. They were merchant kings, they were sultanates at port cities, they were Tibetan Buddhist monasteries uh, that financed caravan trade. People could not really say which came first, which the pilgrimage came first or the trade came first because it blended in such a way connecting the communities, geographies, languages, religions across the Himalayas. Not just with silk and spices, but there was a lot of exchange of ideas. Wherever we see historically, uh, along with trade, culture travels. There is something happening in this valley, which is a, a spiritual high castle and uh, uh, connected to points of the world and the universe. Driving from Patan to the surrounding mountains of the Kathmandu Valley, we came to Yang Le Shou, the cave where the lotus-born master achieved enlightenment. This is one of the oldest Vajrayogini temple. In fact, this is one of the most important Vajrayogini temple. There was a lot of Shakti worship, female energy, female power, Dakinis, goddesses. 
So why did he go to Parping? Well, Shakti Devi, she was a princess from Patan. When her mother died, the new queen mother effectively kicked her out from Patan. She had nowhere to go, so she ended up going to Parping. Padmasambhava came here, and then Padmasambhava had the vision of Vajrayogini and received the in direct initiation from Vajrayogini. There was a time that uh, three years there was no raining in Nepal. So people are sick and people are like going through a lot of suffering. And he discovered that the drought came from the spell of the Naga, a powerful Naga. Nagas in many ways, according to the mythology, is they are a world unto themselves that shares the same material existence that we humans live in. And they are supposed to be serpent-like animals, half human, half serpent. Guru Padmasama discovered that. Then he find the solution. He practiced the Vajra Kilaya, which he already uh, realized, which he already perfected in the Asura cave, he performed the ritual. So the Naga came from all the different directions, the snakes. This entire valley was full of the snake. And then Padmasambhava, through the magic dagger, he subdued the Naga. Padmasambhava invited this uh, one of these uh, uh, Dharma object uh, from Buddha Gaya. There was one Vajra Kilaya, magic dagger. This is how it exactly looked like. My father was an expert in making purpas actually. And I remember him once saying, Purpa Ramalu, means that has copper, iron, and gold. Externally, when you look at it, it looks like a weapon. But if you go really in detail, it's, it has many uh, things that you can understand through this, representing three phases in different form, has different meaning. But in a modern term, it seems like it's like a antenna or a, or a, or a transmitter. So absolutely, if you're thinking a copper dagger as a means to not just receive but transfer information, the, the electrons vibrate along that uh, metal and that's how information can be sent and received. Metal, like color, has their own frequency. A lot of times they complement the frequency of the colors. I mean, every metal has its own, 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 what do you call it, power to evoke certain energy or attract certain energy or to transmit certain energy. Any sharp edge, the more sharp it is, it is accumulating the energy that is going by the surface and then it's like shooting it in the direction where the edge is directed. Is that the right word? Transmitter? Yeah. Of course, I mean, only individually as a purple instrument, probably, I don't know how much it works. But together with the practitioner who has it, and his mind and his practice of understanding and practice and realization and his accomplishment in his practice makes the Pupa active or not active or really is able to do the transmission, transmitting job properly or not, that depends on the individual practitioner. This is the Naga temple. So after Padmasambhava subduing the Naga, so from there Naga took the oath under Padmasambhava to protect the sentient beings. So then the people around there, they also start to keep the river clean, keep the mountain environment clean so that the Naga will not be disappointed again. So from there they did some kind of temple here. So from there to until now, actually the Naga were here before we here. When we come to place and we, we try to build something, we try to dig out, we try to change the environment, so sometimes they get very disappointed. They, so then some of the Naga, they are very powerful. They can change whole environment. They can create war. So, so then this is how... <laughs> this is maybe now Naga is talking. <laughs> so I think Parma Sambhava knew how to do it, you know, how to communicate with the Naga he knew the communication between the human and some formless being. And we humans, we think that we control this world, we conquer this world, when in reality, 
perhaps we are no more than just part of the ornamentation in this world. And there are other creatures in other realms, perhaps in the Naga world, sharing in this world. And so for Pamasambhava, he, in his meditation, he had to perhaps tame, take on these deities, semi-deities. Because human makes Naga angry. Then they get very frustrated. They get very, very angry. So then they create the obstacle, like a drought, feminine, maybe earthquake, you know, maybe tsunami, then there's all this natural disaster. The problem with the humans is memory. We always forget. We forget what we did. We forget what we're supposed to do. So we do a lot of mistakes. So Naga never forgets. <laughs> While meditating in the caves of Nepal, the Lotus-born master received the delegation from King Tritsen Detson of Tibet, who wanted to spread Buddhism across the land of snow. To do so, he invited Shantarakshita, the abbot of Nalanda University in India, to come and build a grand monastery at Samyer. By that time, Padmasambhava was quite well known. Um, he created quite a name for himself, so he was invited by the king to Tibet. Um, at that time, Buddhism was already in Tibet, but the Bon culture, the Bon belief system was also very prevalent. The Black Bon religion, they have a kind of very strong, very old history, very ancient, very spiritualist, uh, and then very powerful. They can, like, do magic, black magic, white magic, all this sort of magics that they can perform. Baitake Most people would not go there huh? because you go through the first mountain then you are in endless jungles and then it gets higher and higher and higher. You have to cross passes between five and six thousand meters. It's an enormous adventure. Now he had the willingness, the force, the guts to do and interact and, and, and mediate. According to legend, when the Lotus-born master arrived in Tibet, he tamed the demons and turned them into protectors of Buddhism, allowing for the Samya Monastery to finally be built. According to historians and scholars, his sheer charisma influenced the Bun court where he was able to invite local deities to become Buddhist protectors. But he was able to come in and not say, hey, you have to convert and this is Buddhism. He was able to 
assimilate, absorb what was there, and make it part of this new belief system of Buddhism that he was introducing to the region. Special duty of Guru Muche is he is very good at transforming bad energy into good energy. Because the syncretic nature of Buddhism, um, and that's why it's so different. The Buddhism you have in India is so different from the one you have in China because they had this way of just assimilating whatever was already there. Tolerance is the key to all of this. As the king of Zahor had done before him, King Tritsin Detson of Tibet was so overawed by the power of the Guru that he offered his entire kingdom to the Lotus-born master. But the Lotus-born master didn't aspire to rule a mere kingdom. His goal was to master the management of energy frequencies on a quantum scale. In order to do this, he required another princess as partner to help bring consort practice to an even higher level. Upon arriving in Tibet, the Lotus-born master reached the epitome of his career in metaphysics. Manifesting as Padma Jungae, he together with his consort Ishi Sogyal perfected the highest form of tantric yoga, combusting light and dark energies into an aura of aggregated force, allowing complete matrix access to the universal hologram. Guru Rinpoche's teaching on light, you know, uh, uh, the meditation on, you know, to have a union, or would you call it these days, you know, sex, it is probably the highest form of meditation, is how do you transform the negative energy in you, in the positive energy, the lust into spiritual energy. But it's, sex is very reactive. It's very, I would say, uh, grabbing on your desire. You will, must have a sense of enjoyment, desire. If you do not have a, joy, a sense of enjoyment, desire, you will not be able to get a touch of emptiness. But when you know your desire is actually emptiness, and you will not be attaching. So in Tantrayana, uh, when the student reaches uh, a level where there's a, a very, I mean, there's no desire. Uh, when you engage in such uh, conduct, there is no uh, sexual desire. With such act, uh, you know, we are able to give rise to the wisdom of realization. Within us is a dormant sexual energy that we have from birth. So in um, certain situations, they get activated and they basically break through from the base of your spine and go up your, uh, the back of your spine, you know, go through all the seven chakras and basically burst through your crown chakra. And then in that instant, you're actually um, connecting with the universal energy source because it is um, combusting at the same frequency. 
there's like you one part if we talk about tantric things and about the real like the sex the an interaction between human beings like male and female different kind of energies interacting with each other and if they establish some kind of resonance between each other that it has not additive effect but multiplic multiplying effect so it means when you get 10 and 10 when they are interacting and establishing resonance it's not 20 it's 100 this is my interpretation of this tantric sex it's, it's basically we, we, we cause a phase shift in that process of intensive extensive difference and that changes the whole system around so we create a different reality we're synchronized your wave-like aspect and my wave-like aspect are literally entangled we're one system we're like two dancers who are completely moving in the same rhythm and way i like very much the uh, the dancing shiva image because of, with his dance shiva created the universe with our dance we create the universe With his Tibetan consort, Ishi Sogyo, the lotus-born master began to leave his teachings in caves across the Himalayas and encrypting them into the universal cloud. So then he went to Jigong area, the valley of Tadam. You can find there many caves. Stories can be told in, uh, when it comes to Tadam area. one of the most important caves uh, called Kiri Yangzong. During his stay in Tedram, he was searching the places around Himalayas to find where is the best place to hidden those spiritual treasures. This is uh, where Pamasambhava hide the spiritual treasure, Therma. With his consort assuming the form of a tiger, he would fly across the mountains of the Himalayas, storing his teachings for future generations in the manifestation of Dorje Trolo. The Dorje Trolo is the most wrathful. The appearance is very wrathful, but internal, his mind is the full of compassion to helping other peoples. The lotus-born master appeared in caves across the Himalayas, hiding the teachings to be revealed later. The most famous cave was in Bhutan, called Taksan, or Tiger's Nest. In Tantra and now, uh, they're, they're, we call it tertia or termas. Uh, they are kept uh, secretly or hidden uh, for the future generation. Usually termas are hidden by gurus in many different methods. Certain things are like uh, Takini script, which we call shoksen, the yellow paper. Um, Takini scripts are like a coat. So when the time is right and the, the treasury wheeler or tertian, can decode the Dakini script and from a small paper like this they can come with one whole volume of text. If some, uh, we call it Tetum, I think it literally translated means treasure revealer, but not like treasure uh, gold or jewelry, but when we say treasure is the sadhana, the practice and sometimes like hidden statues, uh, hidden vajras and pupas and things like that. So my personal experience more with the Timuchan so it's more 
most of the treasure he revealed is what we can go there. It's just like what you say in the, the Dharma cloud. The cloud, um, it's not a physical cloud, of course. It's mostly a hologram. So basically, he is encrypting an intention and a message and information into that hologram. And because it's a hologram, somebody else in a different space and time could retrieve it easily because it's, there's no physical limit. What's this idea that memory is not situated in the brain or in the body, but rather memory is a capacity to situate ourselves at a different time. We are constantly interacting with that quantum reality, that is information field that has everything. That's what from what, from what we started. Everything is there. Everything that was, is, and will be. All of this brought together, this whole topology has been referred to as the cloud. Uh, essentially, it's, uh, think of it as massive, distributed network access to and storage of information. In fact, it's a server that sits somewhere, but that one server is sort of the hub of all the information that gets sent through space and downloaded uh, no matter where you are in the world. When, when scientists start to find out about the effect of quantum mechanics, about how the atom works. It's, many of these scientists, they operated quite secretly in their own laboratories, but this knowledge seemed to pop up more or less at the same time in different isolated laboratories around the world. Also in the history of mathematics, we, we can see examples of how we have had mathematical breakthroughs, uh, such as Riemann's idea of the manifold, for instance. Uh, this new knowledge usually pops up independently in, in, not in exactly the same way, but in very similar forms in, in different places. So there is something curious going on here about how knowledge suddenly at certain historical phases start to just appear independently in different places. Now, is this from the cloud? Well, can only speculate because we don't have a way of, of measuring this with our current scientific knowledge. So if you think of the universe, what we call the universe, it's basically a universal repository for, of all the thoughts that humans or animals or any sentient being has ever thought. Thoughts are energy. So basically every time you think of something, it's somewhere stored in the universe because there's a law that energy does not get destroyed. So the energy has to be somewhere. It all goes through uh, radio waves and frequencies, right? This could be images, this can be videos, this can be text, this can be uh, voice. It can travel infinitely uh, for, for as long as it goes until it's absorbed, right? The way to think about how radio waves are sent um, is they're for over long distances, for example, within the Earth, they're reflected off of the ionosphere. And so it's sent up into the sky, and the sky pretty much acts as a mirror and bounces this information back. And that information can keep being bounced back until it is absorbed. In the case of in a vacuum, this, these messages can travel forever. They're never lost until they are absorbed by a person or device. Interesting about Dharma is that these, the hidden treasures are still hidden there, still classified, which means Guru Pamasambhava's legacies are still there. Among the termas or teachings encrypted by the lotus-born master in the universal hologram or cloud, there's a prophecy that our times would be called the degenerate age when greed, anger, and short-sightedness lead to unnecessary wars and destruction of our environment. Among the social distortions the lotus-born master foresaw in his own words, men will be ruled by anger women by jealousy, and youth will be forever distracted and unable to focus. As part of chaos theory, when social order breaks down, everything falls apart. The forgotten kingdom of Odiana 
from which the Lotus Born Master came will be remembered as Shambhala, a parallel universe, a future of peace, kindness and respect of our planet and environment yet to come. The Lotus Born Master left us with the following prophecy. I, the Lotus Born Master, will bear the name Raudra Chakran, the ferocious holder of the Wheel of Time, the future king of Shambhala, who is escorted by my 25 disciples, subjects and army, will subdue the demons of greed, anger and ignorance. Guess what? He's coming back. could very well be the father of, uh, uh, of what we regard as today as modern uh, quantum physics. I think we can say Guru Rinpoche is the father of everything. <laughs> I think he represents everything, you know. Uh, he represents everything, hope, and uh, he represents joy, happiness, everything. He's a father or mother or everything. Quantum physics is probably one of the the peripheral uh, important uh, events of perception which are happening around us right now. So we have not invented it. it is, we, our time might just be ripe enough that we can understand it. Uh, that it was understood before, it is very likely that again it may be a wave of understanding and not understanding. It comes and goes. So I think now we are at a very positive way. We have brilliant people on this planet who can see, feel, perceive, speculate about all those things without, without being uh, persecuted. Uh, let's use the Padma Sambhava as a symbol of progress, of moving forward, of traditional ideas, of modern ideas to, to really meet climate and challenges of water crisis. But I think the biggest challenge is uh, working together, having uh, cultures that appreciate each other, uh, developing new ideas, and definitely we can look to Padma Sambhava's inspiration. Thank you.